Good morning, everybody. This is episode five of the Off Topical Podcast. My name's Gardner. My name's Raven. And does Valve still have a secret unannounced Linux project? Plus, was Google's decision to not disclose a potential data breach negligent? And Facebook really wants you to know that they believe in your privacy. No, really, guys. But first, if you've subscribed to the audio feed of this show, you might have experienced some issues with actually downloading episodes. This happened because, well, I wasn't very thoughtful in how I designed my custom analytics engine. Suffice it to say, many podcasting apps don't like being redirected, which is the only way I could have handled it. So I'm scrapping the custom solution I built and moving over to Podcast Generator, which is a self-hosted uh, free and open source podcasting solution. But that leaves the matter of analytics. Podcast Generator doesn't handle metrics gathering and instead recommends using AW Stats, which most web hosts use to track metrics anyway. I've updated our privacy policy on the website to reflect the fact that we use AW Stats to monitor hits and downloads for the show now. Thanks for your understanding. And with that being said, you can subscribe to the audio feed at offtopical.net using your favorite podcasting app. And now let's get to the good stuff. Steam Play's compatibility list has been updated. Did you hear about this, Raven? I did. It's pretty cool. Uh, they've got, what, uh, Castle Crashers now, Jonathan Blows, The Witness, Spelunky, Wolfenstein, The Old Blood. I'm actually surprised that wasn't on there to begin with. Uh, yeah. Overcooked and um, the Sam and Max games, which I've, I've never played any of those. Yeah, and these are the newer Telltale uh, Sam and Max games, which is, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit topical. Are they any good? I've never played them. Yeah, I haven't played them either, but I'm a big fan of uh, the Telltale's uh, Homestar Runner series of games. Homestar Runner is one of my favorite internet shows from way back in the day. Really? I've, I've never seen it. Oh, it's, it's so good. If you haven't seen it, everybody out there, I, I highly recommend it. Um, I think that it's awesome to see a lot of these popular games being added to the whitelist. I mean, the fact that a lot of the genres on this list... Are, have a pretty low, you know, representation on Linux right now, you know? Oh, absolutely, especially Telltale games. I mean, they're, well, they're never coming to Linux now. I think they were at one point. We'll get them through Poton, but we'll never get them natively, sadly. Um, I, I think that it'll be interesting to see what the Linux gaming landscape looks like uh, when more titles get whitelisted and the games that are on the whitelist get the compatible with SteamOS badge on their store page. What do you think? I think that's great. Uh, I can't wait until they actually put that in. Like, I think it should have been in there from day one. Um, there is, I don't know if you saw it, but there's a, uh, there's a, I guess it's a Firefox, I think also a Chrome extension. Uh, you can grab it on GitHub and it injects a little bit of JavaScript when you go to Steam. I know, isn't that lovely? Yeah. Uh, but it actually pulls data from, uh, you know, that website that people are currently using steam db no not steam db oh, the other oh, one that yeah. tracks all the proton and then it has like a, a user score that they've been generating mm. it actually injects it and then puts it under the game so you know uh what it is i'll have to find that for you so you can put it uh in the description for everyone yeah if they would like to grab it because it's actually pretty cool i tried it out but i don't really like injecting javascript into my anything does anyone <laughs> I, I don't know someone probably out there does yeah that'd be cool to see that added into the actual uh steam client though something that can you know draw in that yeah exactly like why have they not done that like have their own official thing and people can submit results it's such an obvious you know thing you think they would have done it but valve being valve you know all in good valve time my friend oh yeah <laughs> five years from now look we've added it everyone will be like okay Nice job, Valve. Just pat you on the head. Great. Thanks, Valve. You're, you're awesome. You're <laughs> on top of what the community already did six months ago. <laughs> but uh, I th we want to know what you think. What games do you think deserve to be whitelisted? Shoot me an email at gardner at offtopical.net, and I might read your comments in the next episode. Did you hear about this one? Steam VR uh, AMD requirements have been updated. No, I haven't. I haven't heard about uh, most of the Steam VR. I'm not really a big fan of VR, uh, partially because I wear glasses, and I know some people are like, "Well, some of the newer VRs aren't too bad." But I, eh. I've heard that a lot of the new, the newest VR headsets are pretty good for glasses. People who need glasses, um, but you know, I, I haven't used any of the high end. Uh, VR headsets myself either so I'd be interested to try it but there's such an investment I mean 
You know, we're talking yeah. like what four or five hundred dollars, and all the games are pretty much only for Windows. But I'm gonna get it and play like one game that might work on Linux. Well, that's what's interesting here. Um, so basically, what happens is. Uh, if you're an NVIDIA user, Valve recommends having uh, at least driver version uh, 387.12, and they recommend you taking advantage of the uh, graphics drivers PPA made available by Canonical. And for AMD users, Valve recommends a minimum of Mesa 17.3 with Vulkan support and Linux kernel uh, version 4.13. Direct mode requires Xorg 1.2, and Mesa 18.2 and kernel version 4.15. Now, this is all really interesting because this is all f like uh, this is all for the Linux version of Steam VR. And there aren't many games out there that actually take advantage of the Linux version of Steam VR, at least natively, right? Right. So you, I see a lot of comments on my channel where it's like people say, Linux is such a small demographic, it'll never, it'll never like dethrone Windows. But when I look at what Valve's actually doing here, it's kind of hard for me to see Microsoft's dominance as anything but, you know, permanent, right? Yeah. Like, why would Valve be investing all of their time and money and resources into things like Steam Play or developing a native bridge for VR games running under Proton to enable them to link against the Steam VR native APIs? Or why would they be investing time and money into developing Steam VR for Linux in the first place? The, it's like the nichest of the niche, you know. Here's what yeah. I think. And in the last in the last episode, Ryan was saying that he thought that uh, they're making a uh, they're making a streaming service, and they want to have like they want to have all their servers running Linux and being able to play Windows games through Proton and stream it to people. I think there's something different going on. I think Valve are developing a uh, VR backpack, if you will, and it's gonna be Linux powered. It's a VR console. You wear it on your back, you put your headset on, all the wires are just self-contained right there. And I think that, that like that is like a no-brainer. Imagine being able to go to like a laser tag arena type deal, right? Where they have like a network of uh, tra outside in, you know, lighthouse tracking setups. So you, your controllers are always like kept track of in this big arena space and you're wearing your backpack and a, and a VR headset and you can run around in this huge space and be playing with other people in the same place. Like holodeck level of awesome, in my opinion. I don't know. I, that's what I think is going on with all this uh, Steam VR for Linux stuff. Well... Uh, speaking of uh, walking around inside of, you know, like, a, a, you know, a building and seeing through the uh, the VR glasses, you know, there is actually a company that's setting up a big arcade center doing that. Yeah. Well, I've seen I've seen that some companies are doing that with with the existing Steam, like you know, HTC Vive technology. But really, the problem is um, like the wires getting to the headset, you know? Oh, yeah. They've developed their own little pack and. It's actually streamed in, if I remember correctly, like, oh. you know, because, you know, you got to keep it light. You know, you don't want people lugging around like, you know, 40 pounds of computer <laughs> strapped to your back. Right. Um, I can definitely, at least this is from just my opinion, I don't think they're building a streaming service. I don't either. Uh, no. you, you never know with Valve because Valve will just do anything. Truthfully, I think this, like Steam Play, is just another uh, jab at Microsoft because, you know, you have to remember... I don't think Valve supported Linux because it was the right thing to do, you know, for all of us, at least. Uh, I firmly believe they did it because it was best for them as a business. Like, they didn't want to give up control. Because, you know, every, if you go back to before Valve did uh, Steam for Linux, what was it? It was 2012, right? I'm trying to remember if it was 2012 or 2011 when Steam for Linux uh, dropped. 20, I think it might have been 2012, yeah. They do it because, you know, it's best for them. Like, they need to pressure Microsoft because, again, if you go back to that point in time, Microsoft was already talking about the same stuff that they're trying to do right now, which is, hey, you know, uh, everything just should be on our store and everyone should give us a cut. And if you go back to back then, they were trying to do that with Windows 8. Now, granted, Windows 8 was a monstrosity, but they still tried to do it. And I honestly think the only reason Valve did it was to give them an out, yeah. like to give people an option and to pressure Microsoft. 
And I think Steam Play and by some small extension, Steam VR is probably more about helping you know people want to come to their platform and then support Lino, uh, Windows and Linux easily with one API. But I, I firmly believe that Steam Play is just another attempt to be like, well, you know, with whatever the next version of Windows is, because, you know, there was talk and rumors of uh, the next version of Windows dropping Win32. Right. And that would decimate every game on the market. I don't I don't care what anyone says. If it's not on the Windows store, so, like, you know, the new Battlefield game wouldn't work. World of Warcraft wouldn't work because they're killing, well, the rumor is they're killing Win32. I don't think they'll do that, but that was the rumor. So, again, I think they're just trying to pressure Microsoft. I fully anticipate Microsoft's going to do that, killing off Win32. And I, I and I, the fact that, like, Tim Sweeney and, and Gabe Newell and a lot of, like, luminaries are, like, we don't trust Microsoft, it shows you, like, the direction that the company is headed in, I think. I remember a story from a couple years back that, uh, I can't remember who said it, but one of the devs at Valve said that after they announced uh, Steam for Linux and they started showing the... Left 4 Dead 2 benchmarks and showing how f- much faster Left 4 Dead 2 ran on OpenGL on Win- on Linux than it did on Windows. Like, uh, Microsoft actually sent a whole bunch of people to Valve's headquarters, and they were, like, really inquisitive about what they were doing, why they were doing it, and, it, and like, to hear that one guy tell it, and I, I'll find a link to it, and I'll put it in the show notes, but you hear this one guy tell it, and it's like they were spooked out of their mind that Valve was doing this. And uh, s- to bring L- Steam, which is the, l- which is arguably PC gaming, <laughs> you know, in, in many respects it is. A- and it's like Val- uh, Microsoft was scared of, the, of Valve leaving Windows or, or bringing it to a platform that is arguably a competitor of Windows. So it's like, why would they why would they be doing this? I I think that it's it's like what you said to have an out for for Valve, you know, when Microsoft eventually tries to close down Windows and turn it into a walled garden like, you know, the uh the Mac iMac OS. is. Yeah, like Mac OS. You know, this that it'll let Valve move somewhere else and give gamers who've invested their money and their um and their time into Steam uh, have a place where they can actually use <laughs> the things that they've bought through this digital platform, right? Oh, yeah. And and not just that. Like, you know, can you imagine if for some, and I'm saying very stupid reason, like they pulled all Win32. I mean, obviously, I think if they crush Win32, they will uh, implement some kind of emulation layer or some, you know, something to maintain support because they're not completing a total other idiots because otherwise they would just crumble overnight. But wine. This would give Valve like a huge boon because they're like, look, uh, you know, Windows 11 or Windows Core or Windows, because, you know, that's the hip thing now. You just name your product Windows. You don't put the version or anything. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it. our platform. Just download Linux. It's free. Any of them and install Steam and play all of your old games. You know, and if you already have, you know, Steam, then you can just, you know, up and run and play it. And it's like, you know, in a way, that's that's actually pretty genius. Not to mention, some things work better under Proton than they do on Windows because, you know, some of them really old games, you know, 4.3, 1024 by 768 looks kind of crap on my 4K monitor. Yeah. And it doesn't look much better, but at least with their scaling, it doesn't screw with everything. Right. I, I love the scaling. I can't believe Wine never got that before, honestly. I, you know, one of my biggest problems with, with playing games through Wine was, like, the fact that Wine would change the resolution of my desktop. Like, it just, it drove me nuts. It's like, why would a non-native app ever have the privilege to change my resolution? Anyway, that was, uh, yeah, I'm with you on that. <laughs> But we'd like to hear from you. What do you think about the stories we've covered so far? Uh, why did Valve make Proton? And do you think they're making a, a, a Steam VR console backpack type situation? Let us know. Uh, there's a burgeoning community of thoughtful folks over in the show notes on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash the Linux gamer. We'd love to know what you think. Microsoft pulled the Windows 10 update version 1809 from the store because it was, well, deleting customer data. Did you hear about this one, Raven? 
Oh, I did. Had a lot of good fun talking about this with some friends. It's pretty funny. Yeah, I. What's the word that they have in uh, in uh, Germany when you take delight in in the d misfortune of others? And I'm not. I'm not misfor. It's not the misfortune of the people who had their data deleted. It's the misfortune of Microsoft because they can never seem to roll out a Windows 10 update successfully. <laughs> you know, it's it's crazy. You're so right about that. Uh, there's an up. There's an issue uh, in Microsoft. You know, what, what was the last update? The fall update was from like what 2017 or something. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's an up. There's an issue in that version of Windows. Not for everyone, quote unquote, but everyone. Uh, where uh, they don't properly store their thumbnails. So the thumbnails are just constantly regenerated. It's been almost a year, and they haven't fixed it. And apparently this update maybe fixes it. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, you know, they don't ever fix anything. No, it doesn't seem that way. Uh, so this version uh, of Windows Update here was released to early adopters last week. And some people have found that their My Documents folder and other known folders in their you know, home directory, if you will, it's missing data. Um, things have been deleted, you know, stuff in the, my music folder have been, has been deleted. Uh, Reddit user TKSN shared his experience. Uh, what he said was, I downloaded the assistant and it started downloading. When I woke up this morning, the download and the install had finished. Might be a bit scary to some, but okay, I was going to upgrade anyway. It's scary to me. I then proceeded to go about my daily routine. Upon opening my music mixing program, I noticed something strange. Some of the packaged content had disappeared, and so had my user library. Upon further inspection of the containing folders, the files had suddenly and completely vanished. What do you think about this, man? Uh, truthfully, I think it's terrifying. It's very scary, to me anyway, because I just don't like the idea of an update tanking like you know, the equivalent of my home folder. To me, that's just terrifying. Yeah, exactly. It, ugh, no, 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 no. Have Has any Linux distro had something happen like this? I, I can't recall anything like this happening no. on Linux. I mean, Linux distros have had their fair share of issues, but, you know, Linux distros don't go around nuking entire folders. Right. <laughs> like, like, what on earth could you put in your update that could destroy an entire section of, you know, your user's file system. Like, eh, it's just oh, it's so bad. Yeah, and I mean, this wasn't an isolated incident either. I mean, there were other people on Reddit and on Twitter who had similarly, you know, missing data. Uh, some people were even alleging that Microsoft knew about this issue and still chose to push the release as a manual upgrade, which this didn't roll out to everyone all at once. They do like a, a testing phase first, right? Um, yeah, because they don't have QA anymore because they fired all their QA. Right. Cutting costs. Right, right. Stupid. Um, yes. Uh, Tuesday was supposed to be the day that this big update, what do they call it? Like their insight people or whatever? Windows insiders. So the insiders are, that's <laughs> such a funny thing to call them. <laughs> so the insiders are, you know, they're the ones who've experienced all this. And then they were going to push it out to all home people. And they do it in waves. So not everyone would have been affected. But I agree with some people who are alleging that Microsoft knew about this because there's no way that you could not know about this. Right. I think they were just maybe like, let's just roll the dice. It'll affect a few people. People will complain and then it'll just get swept under the rug like everything else. But then it became like, oh, this is actually kind of widespread. Yeah. And and like in response, Microsoft actually uh, ended up delaying the wider release of this update. Right. But like. To your point, I think like this, this kind of like uh, Windows 10 upgrade problem that seems to be symptomatic uh, of Windows 10 in general, uh, you know, I think it's kind of following like the Apple design model, right? Break things just enough that it keeps people having to forgive you. And that builds brand loyalty, right? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, because that's exactly what it is. I mean, if you look at, you know, Apple, for example, they're like the greatest example of a brand loyalty if there ever is one yeah because no matter what they do their people line up i mean have you ever actually seen an apple store event no, i'm getting kind of off topic here but have you ever actually seen an apple store event you know they make a big fanfare about it like the people come in you know they're all real young they're all hip we understand you i'm also a 19 year old who uses a mac and you know they come in they high five everyone and then they line up and the first people that come in they get high fived by all the 
what do they call them, genius people or something? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's like, they could spend all that time, effort, and money actually training people to make a quality product. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, products that don't, like, fail to charge when you plug in a Thunderbolt cable. Did you hear about oh, that? Gosh. Oh, gosh. Yes, the, the, the charge gate or whatever it is they're calling <laughs> yeah. it. Have you ever, uh, what's his name, Lewis... Uh, uh have you ever seen him? Lewis Rossman. Yes, have you yeah. seen his latest video where they I didn't uh that Toronto news station went undercover to an Apple store and they were gonna like basically charge them the price of a new computer because it doesn't power on. Wait, what? Yeah, so we're just gonna have to replace like your display and uh you're gonna replace your logic board. Because you know, Apple has like water sensors, and you know, some stuff they do is actually pretty innovative. Like having a water sensor is actually pretty nice. Yeah. Except as Lewis pointed out. It'll trigger in humid climate, and then, you know, it'll, it'll I guess, turn off or whatever it does when it gets dry again. Right. I assume that's how it works anyway. But it's like all he did, it was, it was like the most beautiful thing ever. Like, you could not make a more beautiful video. All he did was bend a pin back into place, and he literally said, yeah, we don't charge people for this. It's like it's a bent pin. Oh it's my like God. a minute of work. He's like, yeah, we don't charge anyone. Uh, I... And he's like, if we did charge you, because, you know, he, he did say, you know, the pin's bent. So, you know, you don't necessarily want to use it, but it'll last. And it's sad that he actually said it so calmly. You know, it'll last for the remaining life of the device. And he hinted, you know, like three to five years. I'm like, really? A $2,500 PC is only going to last three to five years? You're kidding me? Oh, unfortunately, no. <laughs> Evidently not. This is why you buy System 76. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, their products are, are awesome. I have several of their laptops, and I've bought some of their stuff throughout the years. Hmm. I, I've collected some, some I've given away or sold again, um, but I have I have some of them, and they are amazing. They still work, and if I have a problem, System seventy six will still uh, help with it, which is amazing because one of them's like five years old. Yeah, they're they're great. I, I love their company. Anyway, we got kind of off topic, <laughs> but this is the off topical podcast, right? That is true. It is living <laughs> up to its name. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so, uh, to get back to what we were talking about, basically Microsoft pushed a fix for this update just, uh, today as of recording, which is actually Wednesday, October 10th. And, uh, they said that they diagnosed the problem and that it was basically coming from the fact that if you remapped the known folders, like my documents or my music or desktop to another location on the file system, you know, if, if you left files or folders in the original My Documents or Desktop or whatever folder, then the new location uh, would be deleted. Am I making sense with that? So is it the files or the folder path that it gets redirected? So it's a, uh, as, if I'm understanding it correctly, what happens is you would, like, essentially mount a new My Documents folder somewhere else on your file system. And then... Uh, but in Windows, like, there's not really the concept of mounting like there is on Linux. So you could still have documents in the old My Documents folder. And if there were old documents in the old My Documents folder and there were new documents in the new My Documents location, then the new My Documents location would get deleted. That, that's my interpretation of, of the article that Microsoft released earlier today. Well, the weird thing about that, at least to me anyway, is... How many Windows users do you actually think would do something like that? Like, honestly, yeah. like, look at even the person TKSN. Do you honestly believe that, that individual remapped their documents folder? Well, he was talking about, like, that he does a lot of audio engineering and stuff. And the idea, maybe, I mean, maybe, you know, like. I just don't see it. But even if they're an audio engineer, like, why would you re? Why would you remap that? Like that requires effort. Well, if you and when like, it works just fine. I can just I can see like if you have like you know a 120 gigabyte SSD and it, you know the user's directory is on that on that disk and you want to have an external storage location. But I guess you know I also see it the other way where it's like why would anyone do that? But obviously some people did if that's what Microsoft if if you are to believe what Microsoft says the problem is here. So I mean some people were saying that it was OneDrive, right? Yeah. Uh some things I heard and was discussing with some other friends, they were talking about how uh they were in some IRC channel. I mean, who who uses that anymore? <laughs> um 
And people were commenting that a lot of people who have that don't have OneDrive anymore, which is interesting because you can't actually remove it on certain versions of Windows. And certain versions of Windows just don't have it. Like if you have Windows in, it doesn't come with OneDrive. But uh, there's been a longstanding rumor going around that Microsoft might pull an Apple. They're pulling too much of Apple, by the way, in my opinion. Well, Apple um, is the wealthiest company in the world, so if they're going to model Well, on paper, like sure, anything. not in reality, but on paper. Actually, no, actually, in reality, too, they have a lot of cash. But then again, when you just remake the same product, you should make tons of money. <laughs> yeah. There's no real R&D there. Right. Um, but no, uh, getting back on topic again, on the off topic here, um, they were looking at using OneDrive as, like, your documents folder. So basically, you know, even if you don't use OneDrive, it's still using OneDrive, which is terrifying to me. Yeah. Like the idea that I don't have control of my files anymore and I don't have a say, like anything I put in. Because, you know, when I used to use Windows, I did use the documents folder. Now, granted, not as often as, say, I would use like the home folder and, you know, home documents and everything. I would usually just like make a folder on the desktop and then, you know, pin it and then, you know, just open that and store everything in there. I don't know why I did it that way. I just did it that way. But a lot of people use documents for everything. And can you imagine like, you know, writing like, I don't know anything like a research paper or something very personal or taking personal photos or anything of that sort. And then all of a sudden it's like always going to, you know, the OneDrive. Cause that's something that terrifies me about, you know, using my Android phone, for example. Yeah. Like I'm always checking every, after every update did, you know, Google change my OneDrive settings or not OneDrive. What do they call theirs? The Google, Google drive? drive. Yeah. God, it's too much drive. <laughs> like, can't they come up with better names? They have billions of dollars. Anyway, uh, you know, I'm always terrified that it's going to, like, grab and upload, you know, stuff off my phone. It's not like I have anything sensitive that I don't want the world to see. It's just, you know, it's it's mine. They don't deserve it. Right. And that's something to me that it really bothers me that it, I hope and it's, like, just a rumor and it doesn't become true. But I have to be honest with you. Given my past experience with Windows and Windows 10, um, it's pretty plausible that they could be pushing it. Oh, yeah. I mean, because then they'll push the 99 cents for like one terabyte thing, you know? Yeah. And I mean, they do that like I mean, they've already used uh, the uh, Windows Explorer as a billboard for, you know, uh, one drive oh. and stuff. And it's like at this point, like I wouldn't put anything past them. They're shameless and they are not to be trusted as far as I can as far as I'm concerned. No, they absolutely shouldn't be trusted. I'm completely in agreement with you on that. So uh, here's a tidbit. Uh, Microsoft joins the Open Invention Network to help protect Linux and open source. The company that's famous for Embrace, what is it? Embrace, Extend, Extinguish is going to protect Linux. Oh, oh. I, I am so excited about this. <laughs> they have the best track record with patents. Yeah, truthfully, um, I don't actually see this as a big deal exactly. Uh, like either way, like whether they join it or whether they don't join it. Um, because the OIN is just kind of like a community thing to make sure that uh, Linux stays clear of patent issues. So honestly, uh, a big patent holder like Microsoft probably could help with that. Yeah. And if anything, maybe it'll make Microsoft loosen up its patents a little bit. Well, that would be nice. And if yeah. they don't, then there's no loss because they were never going to do it in the first place. So therefore, you know, nothing changes for us. But if it does change and they open up some patents, then that's good for everyone. Yeah. I mean, that would definitely be awesome. But at the same time, Microsoft makes, what is it, like $25 off of every Android device because of patents? Oh, yeah. They all do. It's insane. Like Apple makes money. Samsung makes money. Google makes money. Like, if you got rid of that, I would not be surprised at how cheap phones could get. Could get. Yeah. Hypothetically. Could, yeah, hypothetically <laughs> on that one. But yeah, it would be nice to see them get, you know, cheaper. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like, I'm happy with my Samsung. I mean, I'm not, but I'm just, you know, in denial about it. Yeah, um, <laughs> right. Purism all the way, man. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that one. Oh, I can't wait for the Purism phone. I'm going to gush over it like a little girl when I finally get it. Oh, me too. You expect like two or three weeks worth of coverage on that device when it comes out. Um, but my take on this Microsoft joining the Open Invention Network is I don't, I you know, like we said earlier, I don't trust Microsoft. I don't think they can be trusted. 
they have a, a long standing track record of animosity towards Linux and uh, abuse of the patent system and, and like antitrust violations out the buttocks. So I'm, I just do not trust Microsoft. This, they're getting a little too friendly with uh, my platform of choice and I don't, I don't like it. There's always Haiku. If anything else fails, we can go to Haiku. Haiku, yes. All right. We want to know what you think. Do you trust Microsoft? Do you think they're going to uh, get rid of uh, Win32 support? Are they going to push everybody to use OneDrive? Let us know on the show notes or hit us up on Twitter. Uh, I'm at the Linux Gamer. Raven is at Raven67854. And let us know what you think. All right, so Facebook's portal is their window into your home for only $349. Oh my God. This, 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 is, this is like Amazon Key, but worse. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it comes with Alexa, so that's how you know it's trustworthy. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Uh, I'm surprised that they're going to team up with a. Ale- well, wait, is Alexa Google or Amazon? Amazon. Okay, see, so yeah, I'm surprised they're teaming up with Amazon. I was surprised to see that too, but I was also, I like, I fully expected this to be like a voice powered speaker, but I figured, you know, they were going to roll their own kind of baloney like Bixby or something. Dude, it follows you around the room. I know. Like the connect. Oh, oh my God. This is so. Yeah, but is it the mounting platform? Doesn't it rotate or something? Or is it just the camera can slightly shift within its uh, view? You know, I, I don't remember. know. Uh, or I is it that it can it. track you moving around the room? Because they weren't really very specific on that. Yeah. And all of them are very terrifying. I mean, it's the same thing as like a, a smart TV. You know, the smart TVs that like always listen, like all of them. Yeah. It's the same thing. But now we have a camera and it goes to Facebook. And, and the other thing is it's $349. And let's just, you know, let's just take and throw away the the all the privacy and security concerns of it. Let's just throw all that aside for a moment. It doesn't do anything. Right. But it's $349. Yeah, it's... And a, it's called Portal. Oh, uh, Portal. Like, the word is just so ugly. <laughs> I mean, I love the Portal games, but you don't say the word Portal and, and, and like, have, like, heaps of affection coming out of you. You know what I'm saying? No. It's, it's like Portal. It's like the word vomit or something. Yeah, and all you can do with it is Facebook. Yeah, like you can't do anything else. I mean, I guess maybe like maybe some Facebook apps will eventually support it. Maybe. But all they really hinted at was Facebook Messenger. Like, yeah, I'm in the kitchen. Let me just. It's uh, yeah. So I'm looking at their uh, at their landing page here for this thing. And it looks like the cheaper model, uh, which is like one hundred and ninety five dollars, is going to have a wide angle camera. This is my speculation. It's going to have a wide angle camera and then it's going to do like digital zooming and panning. Um, that's my speculation. I'm not 100% sure. The large, the more expensive ones might have like actual rotation capability, but my Facebook wants you to know that they care about your privacy. Did you know this? They care about your privacy. Really? Oh yes. But they sell it to pretty much anyone with money. <laughs> well, here's like the governments. thing. Governments. I mean, my God. <laughs> what they're doing, okay, to make sure you know that they have. Uh, the utmost concern for your privacy is that it includes a lens cap. <laughs> oh my God, dude. Uh, it's, you know, uh, that is hilarious to that, to know, but I mean, the mic's still always going to be on, but whatever. oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, but as a side note to the lens cap, honestly, that should be a mandated thing on most devices that sell and come with webcam i would agree oh yeah like just like a little slide you know it just closes it because i i hate that about my phone you know i'm gonna come across as this crazy conspiracy guy but you know what i do with my phone like when i'm not using you it shut it off and why one reason why I'm trying to reach me no i don't shut it off because it doesn't do any good to shut them things off i believe that they'll just turn themselves back on or they'll just function in some low power state you know i'll go full on with that man i i have like a little box i throw it in the box and then i just toss it in my dresser it's where my phone lives when I'm not, like, you know, out town. Oh, nice. Just lives in my dresser. Is it, like, like a eh. Faraday cage box? Sort of. You know, it's got padding and stuff. Like, the, the sides and the lids, like, makes it harder to hear. And then, you know, it's in my bedroom. So, it's, like, never going to – not really going to be in there except mm. when I'm sleeping. Interesting. You know, that's why I want the Purism phone. I mean, I know for some people that's probably, like, that's a little 
loony and excessive, but it's like, how many times have we been proven that those phones are always listening? Oh, yeah. There's no doubt about that. Like, you think, you people think I'm crazy? Install the Facebook app, because don't tell me that Linux people don't use Facebook, because we know they do. It's just, <laughs> it's just a higher margin of Facebook people don't use Facebook. Right. Because, you know, it's friends, family, you know, if you have that Facebook app, and then talk about something you never do, and then wait, like, eight hours, and you'll get ads for it. Now, whether or not they actually can access that data, see that data, or whatever, that it that I have no idea of. You know, whether or not that's true, and I've heard arguments on both sides, like your phone, if you have the Facebook app, it's always listening to what you're doing and always listening to what you're talking about. I hear people who aren't tech people talk about that, right? Yeah. Like average soccer moms, your average, uh, your average, uh, you know, beer, beer drinking guy, I hear them talk about that. It's like, you know, that actually happened to me. I was talking about uh, something with my wife. And then all of a sudden I start seeing ads for it on Facebook. And it's like, like nobody trusts Facebook. You know what I'm saying? And the fact that like Facebook is selling this uh, speaker with a, with a, with an always on uh, microphone and a camera. It's like how I don't know what their angle is. Like how yeah, and also doesn't a tablet already do pretty much everything that they want to do anyway? Like yeah. if you want to call someone and talk to them, can't you just open up the Facebook app, which you probably already have installed anyway, or whatever you use, Skype, Line, Wire, Talks, love Talks, but you know, no one will ever use that. Yeah. Um and just set it and then, you know, call the individual you wish to speak with. Like, why wouldn't you just you know what I mean? Like, why wouldn't you just do that? Right. And I mean, even like even like the newer Alexa models have a screen and you can do the exact same thing here. Alexa's in a microwave now. Oh, my God. I don't even. Ugh. Did you see that? I, I heard about that and I tried to forget. <laughs> it's in a microwave. Ugh. But don't worry, it doesn't do anything except, you know, it has like a huge database. So you just tell it what you're going to cook or something and then it just cooks it for you. Yeah. And on the one hand, that's kind of cool. Because, you know, it sucks, like, when some things you make are frozen or trying to thaw something or whatever, I guess. And, you know, you just tell it, and then it kind of does it. But on the other hand, everything you're doing, it's sending to Amazon. Yeah. If that was, like, something that didn't connect to the Internet, and you just had to, like, put a USB drive in to, like, you know, uh, update the database that it had, I'd be like, well, shoot, that's awesome. Yeah. But it's like, you know, I'm, I'm going to bring up Lunduke here for a minute. Do you remember one of his talks? He was talking about a uh, Internet of Things powered crock pot yeah why why exactly it, it comes back to that and this this facebook thing again why like it serves no point it doesn't do anything new and then they made a big deal about how your privacy is safe with us but you collect money from the cia and nsa it's i don't yeah if the, if this isn't meant to collect more data about you to gather like facial geometry data about you to like to, to record your voice and get a, a voice model or to like your body map language. Out, yeah. Or to like map out the interior of your home. I don't understand what this is for. And they're paying, they're charging you for the privilege of giving up all your privacy. Like I, I hate this. to do what your tablet already does. In yeah. fact, your tablet does more. You know, it's kind of like the Amazon fire, you know, up until recently, the Amazon fire couldn't browse the web, even though it's a fully functioning Android device. That actually has some fairly stout features on it. It didn't have a web browser. The Kindle Fire? Or, or a way to access anyway. The Fire TV, yeah. Oh, yeah. Apparently has Firefox now. Oh, fascinating. Yeah, go Firefox. <laughs> right. But uh, we want to know what you guys think. Do you, do you like the idea of Facebook's portal? <laughs> Let us know. Uh, well, we want to know what you think. Uh, hit us up on the show notes over on patreon.com slash Linux gamer. We'd love to know what's on your mind. Uh, all right, so this is our last story. Uh, Google Plus had a data breach and then uh, and then all of a sudden Google decides to retire Google Plus. What do you think about this, Raven? Uh, you know, when I when I saw that, I think I saw it in the morning, like, because I think it, it was announced like early in the morning. Yeah. Or, I can't remember, but I, I remember like literally just Wanting to just smash my head on the desk and be like, are you kidding me? Like, oh, yeah, we have this huge data breach. Hey, we're not going to have Google Plus anymore. Like, uh, you fix the bug, but you're going to kill it? I mean, I mean, clearly it's become a liability to the company. It never made money to begin with. Yeah, but, and I mean, 
the they 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 discovered that this bug uh, was available in their API. For those of you who haven't heard about this, uh, the Google Plus API, where it gave basically something like 440 apps that were built to access Google Plus's API, unmitigated access to Google Plus users' private profile data, like phone numbers and and other things that had been hidden from public consumption of your Google Plus page. Google says that 550,000 people were affected by this, but both Raven and I are kind of skeptical of that number, uh, given the fact that, um, what was it, that, that anyone who used the Google uh, Open Auth? Yeah, I'm fairly certain it was the, the Google Open Auth. Now, I could be wrong, but I'm fairly certain from what I saw that it was when you would sign in with your Google account. Now, it might not apply when you sign up for something through a website. Yeah. But it, that all should be the same API. One would think, yeah. Yeah, but it could it could be that apps can access, like, uh, something special that, like, the website can't because they're, like, an Android app, for example. Right. So it's entirely possible. But either way, I do not believe only 500 some thousand people were affected. There's no way. Between You're telling me between 440 apps, only 500 and some thousand people were affected? Considering every single person with a Google account has a Google Plus account, you're lying to me. Yeah, and and the fact that um, this this vulnerability was was like publicly available and exploitable from 2015 until March of 2018, where it's like, you know, only 550,000 people's profiles were affected. I find that I find that hard to believe. Um, yeah, that's impossible. I know no one uses Google Plus, but <laughs> you use features that. Google Plus is essentially. Yeah. So you use it whether or not you want to. Now, some of us have moved away from Google for everything. Yeah, it, it's a it's a load off my mind to know that I'm not using Google's products and services on a daily basis anymore. But um, so here's the thing. They they decided to not disclose this vulnerability even after it was closed, like the, the loophole was closed and they briefed. Uh, the CEO of Google, Sundar Pichai, and he okayed the decision to not disclose this vulnerability. And I, that, I find this to be incredibly irresponsible on the part of Google. And, it, and it, it, like, it violates what little trust in Google that I had left. I mean, Raven, you and I were talking about this like a couple days before this news broke. I was like, has there ever been like a major, major data breach from Google? And, and I think we came to the conclusion that we didn't know of any. And then come to find out this happened. They've, they've had some over the years, but they've always disclosed it. Right. Or it's always been like, we had a data breach, but, you know, all the stuff's encrypted. So, you know, it's fine. They just have a big blob of data they can't do anything with unless they have a supercomputer laying around. Right. But this is different. This is... And 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 in fairness, the data that was leaked is stuff Google doesn't want other people to have because not just the legal aspect, but because that's how they make their money. They don't want other people having access to the thing that allows them to make money. Right. Exactly. This is the stuff they sell to people. <laughs> yeah. So the fact that you could just create an app and then just pull everything is just terrifying. You don't even need to create an app. You just needed to get an API key. <laughs> and well, you still needed to get people to sign up for it to get it. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. So you needed to create something. But, I mean, just imagine, and, and the apps aren't safe. You know, all the time, you know, you, well, maybe apps on Android are safer than some places. But, you know, how do we know that any of those apps weren't compromised? Right. I mean, who like, the thing that really boggles my mind is, like, when stuff like this happens, and, you know, even if it's, like, unwittingly vacuumed up by a third party like a developer and they don't know that they're getting this amount of data about someone how are how do we trust them as stewards of our data we i mean and we barely even have acknowledged that they have a uh, our consent to get that information from google I, like this kind of stuff just blows my mind we live in the like the absolute wild west on the internet and it's terrifying because you know, when when your data is is being just exchanged on on a you know on the black market or on or even just through vulnerabilities like this that nobody knows about for years, it's like where what do what do we do about this? You know, I don't know. 
And then Google decides, oh, hey, uh, within literally hours of announcing this, they're like, oh, here's a new lineup of Pixel devices so that you don't remember about our data breach. Yeah, that blew me away. Oh, my God. They planned that. They did it on purpose. You know, purpose. truthfully, speaking of the CEO, considering he okayed it, and, and you know me, you know how my thoughts on business and government and everything else should work. Yeah. Sundar Pachi, I don't, I don't actually know how to say his name, so I'm, I apologize for completely butchering your name. It, charges should be brought up against him for okay in this. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't, I'm not biggest fan of regulation and various other things. Like, I don't really like the government to meddle because the government can never do anything right. So why on earth would you ever want them to meddle? But there are some times where their existence, like, they fulfill a purpose and they should actually do the thing that they're for. And this is one of those situations. Like, yeah. stuff should be brought in to rein in these companies. Not just rein them in, but put these people in jail. And not for, like, a year. 10, 20, 30 years. Because even, let's just say it is 500,000 people were affected. Yeah. It's 500,000 people's lives who could potentially be ruined. Screw that. Put them in jail. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean. This is this is ridiculous. And there, there's no, I guess the point, the problem is with this whole thing. There's no consequences, and they know it. Right. They don't care. So why would they bother changing? Right. Like, this just shows a show. They announced their Google Pixel. It was it, it did nothing but push it down, and now no one's talking about it. Now they're talking about, like, oh, my gosh, the new phone. It looks so great. It has a notch. Uh, <laughs> and then they have a thing like the Facebook portal. Yeah. It literally does the same thing. Like, none of these companies are innovating i swear they're all like one major company at this point oh yeah they just work together like hey we're making this oh sweet you know what let's make one and let's announce it like two days apart there is no way that either of these projects were a secret to each other uh yeah no well and i mean i completely agree with your point about like none of these companies are innovating anymore None of these companies are are behaving in a way that's responsible because they don't have a reason to behave responsibly. They, you know, if they can like make more money by behaving irresponsibly, then that's what they're going to do. I mean, it's like the it's like the Jake Paul syndrome of of like tech companies, and you know, Google yeah. can do this, or 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 Equifax can leak like people's social security yeah. numbers and like and nothing happens nothing happens and it's like there has to be consequences for stuff like this when if there isn't consequences then this is just going to keep happening and you know we have to like actually stand up to these companies and tell them look we need to be able to trust you with our data if you want to make money from our data from selling it to you know whoever if that's even if that even should be allowed first of all but then then you have to be trustworthy and you have to like take responsibility and do things that like provide like security and 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 not just uh, i don't know i get worked up about this 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 makes me furious no, it's it's a valid thing to get worked up over i mean there are no consequences for them there are none none there's no consequences whatsoever and it needs to happen and i don't even care which you know political side of the spectrum you're on it, it needs to happen it, it is something that absolutely needs to happen and i don't care which side of the political spectrum actually does something about it no i don't either one of them needs to do something about it someone in congress for the united states needs to do something about it they need to be held accountable and you know it's only been a few days so it is possible that something might come of it but personally since he okayed it you know, there are laws in place to, you know, because a lot of people go, well, you know, businesses are shielded, like they shield the individual so-and-so. Not when someone knowingly commits a crime. Right. And he knowingly committed a crime, in my opinion. Yeah, this is a cover-up. Yes. He knowingly did it and then admitted to knowingly doing it. Yeah. So. Because there like, are no consequences. Yeah, there's no consequences. Like, uh, no, put him in jail. Yeah. And, you know, when everyone argues because, you know, and they scream that, you know, it's just you're oppressing him or. You know, whatever other kind of crazy thing you want to do to defend him. It's like, no, this just has to do with the fact that he breached everyone's trust. And just, oh, God, it's so bad. And there's no there's nothing. There's nothing we can do about it. Yeah. That's the worst of it. Yeah. We could sit here and we can yell about it all we want and it won't matter. Right. Well, you know, the thing is, it's like in, in the last podcast, I talked about Amazon's, uh, you know, $15 an hour raise. Right. 
And and I talked about how Bernie Sanders had done this, you know, can call out Jeff Bezos, you know, all this stuff. And and people in the comments were like, oh, my God, you're you're a socialist. If you have anything to do with Bernie Sanders, it's like, no, dude, like, that's not what it is. Because if you listen to the podcast b just before that one, I talked about how uh, Ted Cruz, I was really impressed by how he was grilling uh, Google's chief privacy offer officer keith aaron Wright about how google was suppressing the dragonfly memo about how they were it trying to uh you know engage with uh china's censorship re regime so it's like i don't take sides politically i i i believe what i believe and i will like i will work with people on either side of the aisle who agree with me on whatever topic i'm passionate about i don't care what party you are from and that's what is most important here because this kind of stuff has to be addressed if it's not addressed then then we live in anarchy online and we have to be able to trust the companies that unwittingly soak up our data and collect all this information about us whether it's google or 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 like these invisible advertising agencies or any of this stuff because all this data it will eventually be leaked all of it will it, you know if if any of it can be it will all be leaked that's how you have to approach this and if there are no consequences then people won't take security seriously no you you're absolutely right there's there's too much uh you know, my side this, my side that, blah, blah, blah. You know, people don't uh, people don't really want to tackle stuff anymore. They just want to be right. Exactly. And that's that's not how the world works. And, and, well, it kind of is at the moment, but that's kind of why the world's kind of in such disarray because that's not how it's supposed to work. Right. Um, well, you know, the thing, the reason that I wanted to have you on the podcast, Raven, is because we're friends and, like, we, ha we have a, a difference of opinion quite often, especially when it comes to politics. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, but at the same time, we respect each other and we're able to talk about what we believe, why we believe it. And we don't call each other names. We don't call each other stupid. That is like the like the quintessential hallmark of being able to have a conversation is like having respect for someone, even if you disagree. And that's super duper important. I'm really passionate about that. If you can't tell. <laughs> no, you should be. Well, and, you know, I'm sure people now are thinking, wait, this has gotten kind of political, but. It, this is this is a very political situation yeah here because people are going to defend google because google is a big leftist company for example yeah and honestly like i'm not big on regulation you know that's that's kind of my thing i believe it should exist i'm not one of those crazy people like regulation should exist but i don't like duplicate regulation because that's just a waste of everyone's time but in this case i don't even think regulation needs to be necessary i think a step above regulation and that is actual criminal charges can be brought forth against a company or persons of a company because that's that like he literally okayed a massive data breach cover-up yeah and criminal charges should be brought against him because he okayed it he's at the top and he willingly and knowingly allowed it because how are you supposed to protect yourself from this right like for three years your data has been out there floating around and you don't even know and someone can buy it and then next thing you know because remember, like you and me, we have YouTube channels, which means we had to give Google our social security number because of the whole ads and everything. Yep. Or you need a tax identification number, but unless you have a business, you don't have that. That means technically, if you've ever done that, someone could have your social security number. It's terrifying. It, it's 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 terrible. But uh, for but no one cares. And not even about the political thing, because they perfectly pushed it aside with their new pixel devices and their new chrome device and by the way that pixel tablet or pixel surface what's it called the pixel something i i don't i don't know i don't, I don't know <laughs> it's it's a tablet that they sell a 200 hundred dollar keyboard for which i find <laughs> beautiful because i'll never understand how a chiclet keyboard can cost 200 yeah it's made of plastic you know i have several keyboards and as you know i'm very fond of saying that the greatest keyboard ever made is a model m if you've never if you've never used one, you just won't understand. <laughs> but I also have, like, right now I have my Corsair hooked up. Uh, this one was about $170. And I've had it for six years. It's not an RGB, but it was expensive back then. Mm -hmm. And it's great. You know, it has a steel case. It's really, really nice. But these things are, like, $200, and they're made of plastic. Like, how can they be $200? How could that thing cost $200? 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they're sturdy, don't get me wrong. They're not made out of, like, some cheap, bendable plastic or anything like that, but it's still plastic. It, it, it blows me away. <laughs> but we want to know what you think. Are you more upset about the data breach or are you more upset about the $200 keyboard? Leave us a comment uh, on the YouTube video of this podcast, uh, youtube.com slash the Linux gamer. Make sure you engage with the show notes as well, uh, because why not, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, do you think we have time for some listener comments, Raven? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We always got time for that. Nice. Those are always my favorite. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Doctor of Wumbo on Twitter asks. That's a fantastic name. Right? What are your thoughts on emulating games on Linux? I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, Raven. Now, so I'm wondering, does that mean emulating games? Does that mean like using wine? Or does that mean like, say, something like an N64 or Game Boy emulator? Wine is not an emulator. Exactly. So that's what I'm wondering. Because some people do say it's yeah. you know, wine is emulating. Right. Uh, if it's wine, I'm just going to say it's I have I have no issues with it. As far as like emulating games, like, you know, using Dolphin or anything else like that. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. You know, I'm 28 years old. So in the grand scheme of things, I'm not that old. But there are games from my childhood that you just can't get anymore. Oh, yeah. You know, like, I grew up on, like, Nintendo, the, the NES, the, the Super Nintendo. Unfortunately, I never had any Sega stuff as a kid, which is a shame because the Sega had some pretty great stuff on its own right. Yeah. But, you know, some of those games you just can't get anymore. Now, Sony does a pretty good job at selling their old back catalog. Um, you know, I've, I've bought Metal Gear Solid so I can play it on my PlayStation and my PlayStation Vita. But back to the point here of emulating games on Linux, I think it's great. Yeah. Like, it's just it's just another way to play games that you love. And I don't have any issues with that because, quite frankly, you're using Linux. And that is the only important thing in my book. Yeah, I would agree. I think, um, you know, if you're talking about emulating games as in playing games through Wine or Proton, which isn't technically correct, but if that's what you're talking about, I'm all for it nowadays, especially if you're going through Proton. Yeah, you used to be quite against it. I, I was against the idea of buying games on, like, Windows games in Steam through Wine because it didn't count as a Linux sale. But now that, that Valve have fixed that major, major problem, I, I, I think that it's, it's perfectly legitimate. I, di I didn't have anything against the technology of Wine. I, you know, I just didn't personally like it. The biggest issue was that Linux representation was skewed because of that. But that's a fair criticism. Yeah. Right. If you're talking about emulating games like through Dolphin or through, you know, Lib Retro or whatever, I love it. Um, I haven't done a lot of it on the channel because uh, people don't seem that interested in that kind of content from me. So, but I, you know, I, I do love it. And I actually, on my, um, on my GPD win two, I have retro arch. I have retro arch installed on there. I have a bunch retro of ROMs. Nice. Oh, I love retro arch. Got a bunch of ROMs installed in there, play a crap load of games. And yeah, I love it. It's uh, emulating is like the way to go, especially uh, to your point, Raven, um, games like, uh, earthbound and stuff. Earthbound is my favorite game. I knew game. you were going to say earthbound. I knew it. Everybody knows Earthbound is my favorite game of all time. And it's like... It is a good game, in, in fairness. Yeah. And it's like the only... The first legitimate copy of Earthbound I ever owned was when I bought the SNES Classic Edition. You know? Wow. It's, it's very... It's difficult to get your hands on the cartridge. It's super expensive, first of Even all. Even if you get your hands on the cartridge, you got to get your hands on a Super Nintendo. Yeah. Right. And then you have to get your hands on a television that you can actually hook it up to. Yeah, because screw hooking up to an HD. Because yeah, it just uses I the uh, what RFI connection or whatever. Uh, you can actually get native RGB out of it, but uh, that's a oh, whole I different. Didn't, I didn't know that because as a kid we always had to hook up the uh, you know the good old coax. <laughs> yeah, the good old. You know, coax. turn it to channel three. Yeah. And then like you know the VCR doesn't work right because the VCR is set wrong, so you end up on like you end up having to set it on like channel three on the VCR and then like another <laughs> channel. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh, no one will remember those days. It makes me feel old talking about that. Oh, you know, dude. Like hitting the television, like, why are you not working? I was, I did stuff like that all the time. Like, I had an original PlayStation, and I went and bought, and I had a really crappy old TV. It was, like, one of the first, like, color TVs that you could get, and it was, like, probably, 
Uh, oh, gosh, that'd be, like, from the 70s, man. That thing was probably terrible. Oh, dude, it didn't even have, like, the actual aerial, like, input. It only had the aerial input. It didn't even have a coax on it, right? But, like, I ended up, I was a little kid, and I realized I could cut the end off off a coax and, like, hook it up to the aerial inputs, and it would work. That probably definitely didn't look right. Oh, it didn't. It, yeah, I kept had a, I kept having to adjust the vertical hold. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing, but I had a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> That's always the best. Yeah. Um, Dr. Nima Panahi, one of my Singularity Club contributors on Patreon, asks, Why is duplication of effort a vital component of free and open source software? And I, I like this question a lot because I think it touches on something um, that is really important to discuss. If you've ever watched one of Lunduke's original uh, Linux sucks videos, he talks, he goes out of his way to say it is silly and foolish to package and repackage and repackage and repackage the same app on all these different distributions for all these different package managers. But then he, but then he flips it on its head and says, but that's also what makes Linux great. I agree with that. I think that what we do here is we have a plethora of choice. If we don't like one distro that uses uh, system D, we can go to another distro that uses what is it, init V or startup or upstart yeah. or whatever, you know, we, I don't remember what it is, but yeah, yeah, we, can, we have tons of choice, right? We have tons of choice and the duplication of effort allows us to be innovative. I mean, just the fact that like there are three major, like, there's snappy and flat pack and um, app image, right? Just the fact that those three different things exist allows people to work and, and come up with ideas and solve problems in different ways and find what works best. That's super important. I, I heard a hypothesis on why retail in, in the United States and around the world is dying. And it's not necessarily because Amazon is you know undercutting prices. It's because most retailers are all stocking the exact same thing as every other retailer. So if you can get it on Amazon and it's the same thing you can get in the store, why even go to the store? The businesses that do the best are the ones that focus on like boutique and, and have niche products that you know, you're gonna want to go and see for yourself and try out. And it's the same thing with open source in my opinion. What we need to do is have, or what we do do, is we have a bunch of people, really smart people, working on great projects that might converge at some point in terms of functionality. But they're able to work on these things and build awesome solutions to problems because, because like, it's, a, it's an open playing field and anyone can do anything and people can join the projects that make the most sense for their interest. Am I making sense, Raven? No, I agree. Uh, all of that makes sense. You know, it, one of the things that makes uh, Linux in general just fantastic is the fact that we have choice. I mean, you know, one reason, I guess the best reason for, uh, or I guess a good example, the best reason is to why duplication of effort is a vital component of open source software would have to be desktop environments, in my opinion. Mm, yeah. I mean, because if we... If we didn't have duplication in desktop environments, we'd all be rocking GNOME 3 or KDE. Right. Or could you imagine if we were still rocking, like, I can't remember some of the old ones, but, you know, there's, uh, what, there's XF XFCE. Yeah. There's i3, which I'm a personal fan of. Can you imagine if we were all just using i3? I mean, that's what most people think a Linux distribution looks like if they're not a, a Linux user. I, I know, right? That's That's what, like, come on, like, every time I have friends who use Windows and they're always like, I don't want to use the command line. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. And every time, as an example, they'll always show me some video of some guy working in like inside of i3. And I'm like, nah, trust me, you won't be using i3 anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can, but but uh, no, uh, that in my opinion, that's the greatest example of uh, uh, why duplication is great also lunduke if you haven't seen any of his linux socks videos go watch all of them yeah they're because great. that's basically the whole video right there is you know why it's great you know we have choice and also too this also makes linux really hard to cripple in a way yeah 
maybe not necessarily the kernel, but stuff that actually because the the kernel Linux is just a kernel anyway. You know all the stuff that you know we interact with or you know at least visually anyway. You know all, all that stuff separate. You can build. You could just use the kernel and some other components and run just a command line if you want, or a terminal, I guess. Yep. I don't know why you would, but if you wanted to, there's absolutely nothing stopping you. Unlike Windows, where you're stuck with their thing. <laughs> the Windows way, TM. The Windows way. I mean, there are some, you know, inherent disadvantages to it. There's no consistency. Yeah. I mean, you know, the GNOME and KDE battle will go on until one of them collapses, or they both collapse. But could you imagine if we only had GNOME? No, I can't. I think GNOME would be worse off as a project if it was the only desktop environment. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they had the bright idea to integrate a JavaScript engine into their entire desktop environment. I mean, <laughs> I was going to say, I could hear the sarcasm in that. Yeah. <laughs> you don't like JavaScript. <laughs> well, it, it works. You know, it's like, all right, you're going to use it on the web. Fine. Don't put it inside of my desktop. <laughs> but hey, the point is you can do it and it's actually super important. And I, I encourage it. Like if you ever see anything and you think you can do it better, go do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I agree. Don't just sit around and think you can't do it. Just go do it. Yep. I want to thank both of the people who submitted questions today, uh, at Dr. of Wumbo on Twitter and Dr. Nima Panahi. If you have a question, you can tweet it to me, at the Linux Gamer, or you can uh, send me an email, gardener at offtopical.net. Had to think for a second on that one. You can always catch the latest episode of the show at offtopical.net or on my channel, youtube.com slash the Linux Gamer. Uh, you can follow Raven on Twitter. What's your handle, Raven? Uh, it's at Raven67854. Cool. And thanks for being here today, by the way. No problem. Glad to finally be able to be here, too. I know. <laughs> I, I've had a lot of fun. This was a, We had a great discussion. Uh, and I want to know what you guys think. Uh, leave a comment on YouTube. Send me an email or uh, hit me up on Patreon or, or Twitter. This has been the Off Topical Podcast, and let's do it again soon.